We needed a Savior who would come down from heaven and reach down to us in our imperfections and then pay for our sins and misdeeds. And if we would trust in him, he would take us up into a relationship with God Almighty. And that's why Jesus came at Christmas. He came to do just that. Jesus was an agent of grace. And Christmas time is all about that liberator from heaven coming to each one of us to offer grace and freedom from our sins because of his cross. You see, the Bible says God is a gracious God. Did you know that? And that means he loves to be gracious to us. God loves to bless people who don't deserve it because that's his nature. And I'll tell you, I'm glad about that, aren't you? We certainly are. I'm glad God loves to bless people who don't deserve it. In fact, you can't understand the Christian life until you understand that concept of grace because it's the, the heart of our faith. It's the heart of what it means to have a relationship with God. In fact, I'm going to tell you, the more that you understand God's grace, the closer you're going to feel to God, the more you're going to be drawn to God, the more you're going to love God, the more you're going to be grateful to God because it's by His grace that we experience that liberation that He has, that forgiveness of sins. Now, some of you may be asking, Mike, what, what do you mean by grace? Well, I want to tell you four things this morning because grace has many aspects to it. In fact, there's probably no one single definition to talk about what grace is. Now, if you went to Awana, you probably learned this definition of grace. It's a great one, by the way. Um, what is God's grace? Here's the first definition. Grace is God's unmerited favor. In other words, it's a favor that we don't deserve. Another definition of grace, and I really like this one, is this. Grace is God's love in action. Think about that. All the things that he does in our lives. That's a second definition of grace. Another definition of grace is God giving me what I need and not what I deserve. Now, aren't you glad for that definition? I'll tell you. And yet another definition, grace is the face God wears when he looks at my failures. Wow. And he responds in a gracious way. Now, there is a difference between grace and mercy. And this is interesting in this next slide. Mercy is when do God doesn't give us what we deserve, which is punishment. Grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve, and that's blessing. And that brings us to the second thing today about grace. Grace, number two, brings liberation and not condemnation. Now, in the Bible, there's a story of a woman who had all kinds of moral failure, failures. In fact, she had a real reputation. One day, some religious leaders actually caught this woman in the act of adultery. And they brought her to Jesus in front of a big crowd, and they threw her down on the ground, expecting Jesus to condemn her. But you know what? Jesus showed this woman grace. He defended her. He protected her dignity. And this is how the story goes over in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. It says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach him. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. You know, scholars have wondered for years, what was it that Jesus was writing in that dust on the ground? And there have been a few theories. The one that I really like is that what, what Jesus was doing is he was writing the names of each one of those religious leaders that had come to accuse that woman. And then next to the name, he may have been writing all those little secret sins that they didn't want anyone to know about. Oh, here's Yosef. He's been taking money from the coffers. Or here's so-and-so. He, and, and, and one by one, and notice what happened is he started writing, what does it say? And those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, I like this part. 
Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. My friends, that's grace. That is grace in that story. Jesus looks at this woman who's filled with guilt and shame and in the privacy of that personal conversation says, where are the people condemning you? She said, well, they've all gone, Lord. Then Jesus says two very profound things. He says, neither do I condemn you and then go and sin no more. Notice there's no long lecture. There's no big lesson he says, neither do I condemn you. Leave your life of sin. Now, most of us know John 3, 16, don't we? But what does it say in the very next verse? John 3, 17. Here's what it says. For God did not send his son in the world to what? Condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You know, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, and you're afraid to come to Christ because you're thinking, man, I'm going to be filled with all kinds of condemnation. Let me just tell you, you don't understand grace. You don't understand grace. Grace, my friends, brings liberation. It doesn't bring condemnation. Here's what Isaiah said. Yet the Lord, let's read it, longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. You see, it's God's nature, my friends, to bless undeserving people. And he's waiting today for you to accept his grace because he loves to be gracious. His heart's broken for us and he wants to show us his grace. Now, does grace mean that I accept God's gift of grace and salvation and then go right on living a life of sin afterwards? Uh, no thumb in my nose at God? Of course not. That's not what it means. Because remember, there are two very important, profound statements that Jesus gave this woman who was caught in adultery. He said, I don't condemn you. But then what did he say? Go and what? Leave sin no more. Leave your life of sin. He didn't say, well, you know, just keep on doing whatever you're doing that's destroying your life, you know. Didn't say that. No. He says, don't keep doing the things that are opposite God's laws. They're just wrecking your life. He said, go and sin no more. Because, my friends, grace is never a license for sin. Grace, grace brings liberation from that penalty of sin, and the freedom and strength to live for Christ. That brings us to the third thing this morning, and it's number three. God's grace is based on his unconditional love for us. You know, one of the most wonderful realizations about grace is that I can just enjoy God. Did you know that? I, I can just enjoy his goodness and his mercy to me because that grace flows from his unconditional love for me. And it's a love, I gotta tell you, that I never asked for, that I never earned, but it's there just the same. And one of the most beautiful illustrations of this idea of grace is found over in 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you wanna turn there, you can. That's on page 220 in that Bible in the seat rack in front of you. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, there's a story of a young disabled boy, and his name is Mephibosheth. Now, how would you like to have a name like that? especially on the playground, you know, in uh, first or second grade. Well, Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan. Jonathan, of course, was the son of who? Son of Saul. There you go. Saul, of course, was Israel's first king. Well, later on, when both Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle and David became the king, what happened? All of a sudden, Saul's relatives became immediately afraid. They were all afraid that since now David was king, uh, David was going to clean house and get rid of all of Saul's remaining relatives and just wipe out any trace of the old king and his family because that's often what happened in those days. The new king came to the throne and the remaining family from the old king, they were done away with. And so all of Saul's relatives tried to escape and hide. And in that rush to escape, the nurse who was assigned to carry Jonathan's young son, Mephibosheth, dropped him. She dropped him on the ground as they were fleeing, and young Mephibosheth's legs were broken, and he became a cripple. So in the years that followed, as he grew up, he was not only crippled, but it appears he was trying to hide out from David, afraid that uh, maybe the king would retaliate against him like many had done before. Well, finally, Mephibosheth's hiding out, and one day, 
some messengers, they were probably soldiers, came to Mephibosheth's door. And they said to Mephibosheth, the king wants to see you. Come at once. Well, Mephibosheth probably thought, you know, that's it. I'm dead. The king is clean in house, and I'm next on his list. But let's see what happened in this beautiful story of grace. When he, Mephibosheth, beginning in verse 6, came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. See, Jonathan and David had been best friends, and they had made a pact that they would take care of the other's family should one of them die first. But apparently, Mephibosheth didn't know that or didn't believe it would happen. And so David goes on, I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, everything belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, Yes, my lord the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Wow. Now I want you to imagine the fear that Mephibosheth had when that knock came on the door and he saw the soldiers there. He was probably thinking, it's all over. I'm done. The king's got my name on his list. Then imagine his surprise when he arrives and and David says, I'm going to take you in, Mephibosheth. I'm going to make you part of my family. I want you to live here in the palace the rest of your life. I'm going to pay all your bills. I'm going to meet all your needs. I'm giving you back the property that belonged to your father and grandfather. In fact, I'm going to have his chief servant and his 15 sons farm it for you. And not only that, you're going to sit at my table every night. You're going to dine with me. I'm going to treat you like one of my own sons. Wow. That, my friends, is a picture of grace. It's a picture of God's grace, only guess what? God's grace is even greater than the grace of David because the Bible tells us that God comes to us. We're broken. We're disabled in areas of our lives. We're crippled emotionally. Other things are happening. And God comes to us and he says, you know what? I want to bring you in my family. I I want you to sit at my table. I'm going to treat you like royalty. One of my own simply because of my grace. Now, is that something we deserve? Not at all. Do we deserve it? No, it just flows from his unconditional love. We just have to receive that grace. And that brings us to the last thing this morning, and it's number four. God's grace has many facets. Now, a lot of what we've been talking about so far today, my friends, has to do with God's saving grace. He saves us from our sin. But in this next slide, did you know that it just doesn't stop there? Grace continues in our lives in many different forms. Because after God saves us, he begins that restoration process in our lives to bring us to wholeness and completeness. That's what we call restoring grace. And then God wipes out our guilt and helps us to start over. After that, God gives us what's called sustaining grace. That's the great God gives us to keep on going when it gets tough. It's that grace that we have so we can take another step even when we don't feel like we can. Sustaining grace. And then his grace brings healing to our lives. We've seen that a lot in our body this year as we've prayed for people. God's grace brings liberation. It liberates us from the hang-ups and the sins that we have. And by his grace, his assuring grace, when we have doubts, uh, God comforts. He brings that assurance. And finally, there's growing grace. Growing grace is that grace God gives us so that every day, every day, every day, we become a little bit more in the image of Jesus. I like what Robert Gass wrote. 
he said these words, grace is what enables you uh, to love a difficult, that should say mate, not what you had for dinner, okay? A difficult <laughs> mate. It probably helps with a difficult eight too, I'm not sure. Grace enable is what enables you to love a difficult mate, to keep waiting for a prodigal to come back, to endure prolonged illness, to live with little yet give much, to overcome disappointments, and forgive repeated offenses. Grace takes you beyond your natural ability by forcing you to rely on God's strength alone. Here's what the Apostle Paul, amen, here's what the Apostle Paul writes. Let's read it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God in his grace saves you through the cross and through Christ. And it's by that same grace that God's working in your lives to make you into a workmanship. Another way to understand that is the word masterpiece. God's working to make you a unique masterpiece so that you can accomplish all the works that you would never have thought of doing or even have been able to do on your own. But because of his grace, now you can do all the good things which God has planned for your life, which he planned long before you were even born and long before you even gave a thought about God. You see, my friends of all the religions, Christianity is the only religion that's built on grace, that just says God just gives you salvation. You don't do anything to earn it because Jesus already earned it for us at the cross. He he paid for your sins. I'm not getting to heaven based on what I've done, based on obeying laws and rules and traditions because that's never gonna work. I'm getting to heaven based on what Jesus did for me on the cross. John 1, 17, The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus was the bringer, if you will, the agent of grace. And that's what he came to bring to us, my friends, at Christmas. And it's a grace that first first saves us, then it restores us, then it sustains us, it heals us, it grows us into that workmanship of God, a masterpiece of grace. And all you have to do is receive it. And so as we come to the communion table today, I'm going to pray, and as I do, I want the servers to come forward. But I want us to remember God's grace, how at that first Christmas, he came as an agent of grace to save us and work on our lives. Let's pray.